17. John chapter 17 in your Bibles tonight. And we are continuing our studies on prayer and uh, not uh, how to pray. And uh, there are so many things in the Bible about prayer. But these days we're, we're looking at prayers and uh, things God tells us to pray for. And in John 17, many people call the Lord's Prayer, they use the term the Lord's Prayer for our Father which art in heaven. And that is the title we put there, but it wasn't Jesus' prayer. That was a model prayer, an example prayer. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples to pray. And he said, when you pray, pray after this manner, our Father which art in heaven. It's kind of an outline for us to pray. You want to know how to pray? Uh, you start out with just some worship. Hallowed be thy name. Uh, thy kingdom come. Let him know, hey, whatever you want, that's what I want. I've got some desires. I've got some wishes, but I want your way. Give us this day our daily bread. Ask for your needs. Um, give me some, you know, if I want, I don't want a daily bread. I want daily pork chops. Um, whatever it is, forgive us our debts. Um, ask forgiveness. Make sure in your heart you've forgive, forgiven those who've hurt you. Um, the uh, Louis, Louis Zapparini, am I saying that name right? Anybody know who I'm talking about? The, um, it's interesting. I don't know if I mentioned this. I've preached this in so many different places the last couple of weeks. I'm kind of confused more than normal. <laughs> We were sitting at lunch with Pastor Blue at the Hometown Buffet. We were on vacation. Our whole family, there's nine of ten of us, and Pastor Blue sitting there. And, and, and I just try to egg on conversation. I don't care what he talks about. I just want him to talk. So sometimes you need to say something to get the ball rolling. I said, hey, tell us how you got things going with that youth department in Van Nuys. This is the late 50s. He had 900 in his youth department. Uh, they, now he had junior high, high school, and college. But that's a huge youth department. And he just got rambling and talking about the, what he did and how he did it. And, and at one point he said, um, you know, I, I used some people. He said, uh, I had Roy Rogers and Dale Evans helping me. And I said, wait, wait, wait. Roy Rogers and Dale Evans were your youth workers? He said, well, yeah, Roy really didn't work that much. He was okay. Dale, she was a good worker. <laughs> I've known him for 40 years. I had no idea he was personal friends with them. And I said, yeah, and Trigger probably lived across the street. No, he said he was in a stall across from the youth department. So I said, he knew where Trigger lived. And he talked a little more. And then he said, and Louis, Louis Zapparini, he helped us in our youth department. Well, Louis is the story of the Air Force guy shot down in the boat forever. It's the unbroken story that's been made popular. And uh, captured by the Japanese, Japanese prison camp. Then ended up being a missionary to work with the Japanese people. And uh, all, and, and he just passes over it like, oh yeah, Louie worked with me, Dale and Roy worked with me, and Trigger, and anyway, <laughs> he's a pretty amazing man. But um, Louis Zapparini, that Louis, he said this about forgiveness. He said, if you ever bring something up again, you did not really biblically forgive them. Because people asked him often, how could you work with the Japanese who hurt you so much? who hurt our people so much. And he said, you forgive. And he said, when you forgive something, it never comes up again. Because our sins, does God ever bring our sins up? There are sins and iniquities will I remember no more. As far as the east is from the west, God will deal with me today on what I've got to offer God today. What a wonderful savior. And uh, just that, that whole thought of forgiveness and forgiving others, wonderful thought. And that had just come up in conversation that, uh, and I'd found that quote of uh, Louis Zepparini somewhere in one of his books. But um, boy, this, to, in prayer, to forgive others. You may have to ask God to help you forgive people. You may, you may have some grief in your heart. Uh, there are people who have been hurt so bad it may take years for you to get. That's, that's between you and God, none of my business, because I've never been hurt like many people have been hurt. So I could never judge anybody on that. But biblical forgiveness puts it away, and it's literally away. And, uh, you know, so often how we are with forgiveness, we want to forgive people, and we want to remind them over and over how much we forgave them. That means you didn't really forgive. That means you're just tolerating them as long as you get the credit. And, and, or we want, to pun it. we want them to hurt like we hurt. Yeah, I'll forgive you, but let me tell you how bad. I'd like you to, I don't, anyway, I'd like you to hurt like I, I want you to understand how deeply I've been wounded. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't ask you and me to hurt like he hurt? 
Wow. Thank God for forgiveness. So tonight though, John 17, this is the Lord's prayer. This is when Jesus goes to God and begins to pray. Some would call it his intercessory prayer because much of it is on behalf of you and me, his prayer for others. And I'm going to give you an outline, maybe 5.65 if I have time tonight out of John 17. There's an enormous amount of Bible doctrine here. And, um, but I'm going to try and just do some simple things. So first of all, I'm going to read the first five, six verses and see if you can't figure out the most basic principle of prayer. You ready? You're looking, remember you look for repetition. God doesn't repeat words because he doesn't know any other words to use. He repeats words because he wants our dumb heads to catch it. So follow along with me, John 17. These words spake Jesus. And, and again, if you're new tonight, I don't always wear a bright blue jacket. I do not always wear a bright red shirt or a very loud, it's a Christian tie, crosses, churches, and anyway, Bibles on there. But anyway, this is not my normal attire. This is my VBS attire. In case you didn't know that, in case you see this on video, I'm not the weirdo with the blue jacket. I am tonight, but not normally. I might be weird normally, but not in uh, this. But anyhow, verse, chapter 17, verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth, and I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the, unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Look at verse 10. All and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. All right, you got a word? Glorify, right? Or glory, or glorify, or glorified, whatever tense of the word. And so, number one tonight, our prayer, the, just the absolute highest goal of our prayer is the glory of God. I want God glorified. Look at those, again, those, uh, I just, I have these marked in my Bible. At the end of verse one, the hour has come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. And you know what? Glorify thy son. What is he talking about when he says glorify thy son? Kill me. Beat me. Abandon me. Hang me on a cross despised and rejected and then leave me in a cold empty tomb for three days that I might rise from the dead Jesus said he said glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee if God I, I, your, your, your adult Sunday school lessons starting a week from this Sunday are going to each week you're going to have a story from Baptist history and I'll tell you, I don't have the grace. God gives us grace for what we're doing today, not for what we're, somebody else is doing. And I read those stories and think, boy, you've got some grace. There are some great Christians in, in history, and, and you're going to hear about some of them. But Jesus said, I want you to glorify me that I might glorify you. And this, what, what is, what is going to glorify Jesus? What's going to glorify God? The, the betrayal, the, the abuse, the rejection, the crucifixion, and death. And... Uh, you don't see Jesus here saying, don't do this to me. You see him saying, if you'll be glorified, that's so important. Look on at verse, uh, um, verse three. I have glorified thee on the earth. I've finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Verse five, o Fa now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had. It's all about glo the glory of God and the glory of Jesus himself. Verse 10, I and all, my, uh, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Everything, the, the most basic premise of our prayer life ought to be, God be glorified. That's whatever it might be. And, and uh, remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus prayed, he said, Father, if it be possible, deliver me from this they take this cup from me. And, uh, and he said, nevertheless, not what I will, but th what thy will. He wants God glorified. 
And so we pray, um, of course, bring your needs. I love the verses we mentioned earlier, the, the model prayer, give us this day our daily bread. And over in, in 1 Peter, casting all your care upon him. And Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I'll answer thee. And, and, uh, and I'm losing track of numbers now. Um, what sort of things you desire when you pray, believe that you shall receive them. So he's willing to open this prayer thing up to a whole lot of people and do a whole lot of things. It's not just, you know, thy will be done and I'll just take it. Man, I've had so many answered prayers. I've had God do things for me that were just totally selfish and all about Bruce. And I've seen God do things for us as a church and God's good. God is so good to us. And, and uh, boy, we just don't, don't allow, probably some of you need to not watch the news and not listen to the news because if you're not careful, the news will get you so down. If you can't listen to the news and stay up and on top, then don't do it because the, I mean, the, the liberals will get you discouraged because they're such idiots and the conservatives will get you discouraged because they're so gloom and doom. Because they're trying to make all the conservatives realize the world's coming to an end if you don't vote in a Republican. I'm thinking we did that several times recently and I've not seen a whole lot of improvement. I want Jesus to come back and sit on the throne. He'll fix it all up. Today would be just fine. So number one, pray for God's glory. I'm not saying at all that you should not pray for your needs or your children or your friends. And we're going to get to that in a minute. But, but first, tell God you want him glorified. Just, and, and, and it wouldn't hurt at all to say, God, if, if this hurt would glorify you, then don't take it away. Give me grace. Just give me grace to do it. And, and so our prayer life ought to focus on God's glory. That's why we're here. Over in the book of Revelation, it says that we are his creatures and, 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 and for thy pleasure we are and we're created. I'm here for God's pleasure, not for my pleasure. Number two, um, prayer. And just I want you to look at these next couple of verses. Prayer is just talking to God. This is the most simple thing. Um, he says in verse four, I've glorified thee in the earth. I've finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self. Verse six, I've manifested thy name to the men which thou gavest me out of the world. I've talked about you everywhere I went. And uh, thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. And now, now they have known that thou, that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given them unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee. You know what he's doing? He's talking. He's not asking for anything. He's telling God, well, you know, God, I, I took what you gave me, and I gave it to them, and you know, I've taken your word and told them about that. They believed it. They've accepted it. You read through, and we don't have time. We started late tonight, and I feel bad about that. But you read through John 17 and see how much of his prayer is just chatting. Well, your, your people did this, and I did this, and the people you gave me did this. And, well, these are your people, God. They love you. And he's, it's like sitting across the living room with a glass of iced tea just talking about your day. And I really think one of the things missing in our prayer life is just talking to God. Just about anything. I like talking to my wife. I like walking with her, talking with her, hanging around her. I like, I like being with my family. One of the hardest things with having some of our family on staff is Josh's office right next to mine. And we got work to do. And every time he's doing something, I want to go in and see what he's doing. <laughs> I can't do that. I got work to do. He's got work to do. He didn't need me button in. And I've got my wife down there as one of the secretaries and, and uh, Matt and Esther down th there in. And, and I think I, I love being around people. I see somebody from some of you coming in through the office and I'm in my office working. I'll hear somebody's voice. I think I'm going to go see what they're doing. Well, I can't just stop every time somebody comes in to drop their kid off for school. But I like people, and I like to be around them, and I like to talk to them, and I like, to, it's really something here, here tonight, I don't know if you noticed it, but we were dismissing kids, this kid walked up, put his hand under there, and he said, bye preacher, I have no idea who the kid is. Did the same thing last night, see you tomorrow, and then the night he said, I hope you beat the devil arm wrestling. <laughs> he doesn't know I plan the skits, I will beat the devil. <laughs> Well, a couple years ago, we ran the devil off and he fell in the baptistry. That went over really good. 
<laughs> but, uh, but I love talking to our children and I love talking to our, and, but, but you like people to talk to you. Wouldn't, wouldn't God want you to talk to him? Just you're driving over and work. Talk to him about your day. Man, God, that boss. He must have problems. Talk to him about your, boy, the traffic's bad. Just talk to God and, and enjoy fellowship with God. And prayer is talking to God. This is an example of biblical prayer. You will not find anyone, obviously, any closer to God than the Lord Jesus was. And yet he had that casual, chit-chatty conversation. Look down at verse 6. Um, he says in verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. I've talked to them and told them about you. And You know, you witness to people. You taught a Sunday school class. Tell God about it. Some of you taught children's classes a little bit ago. But on the way home, and I said, God, I taught those kids, and I hope they got it. And, and you know, tomorrow I'm going to teach them again. I, boy, God, help me. I want to take your book and give it to the world, but God, I need your help. And, and he's just talking to him about it. But anyway, uh, I want you to look now about the world and the issues of the world. There in verse 6, notice again the repetition. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. He's talking about the disciples and those that he's trained and those that he's worked with. And he said, those that came out of the world, they're the ones that I have I have manifested your name to. This is going to brush on a, the doctrine of separation. But the more you separate yourself from the world, the more God will open up his book to you. That's right. The closer you are to the Lord, the further you are from the world. Remember in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, Come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I'll be a father unto you, and you should be my sons and daughters. So everybody who gets saved belongs to him. Everybody that gets saved is going to heaven. But if you want something real close with God, you're going to have to separate from the world. The world that hates the Bible and hates God and hated Jesus and killed Jesus, that world can't be our friend if we're going to have our eyes opened to the word of God. And so he says here, I have manifested your word. But let's look at some more. And if you want to mark these, I just mark the word world through here. I go down at verse 9. I pray for them. Look at this next phrase. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou gavest me, for they are thine. Now, we know John 3, 16, God so loved the what? But when Jesus goes to prayer, he's praying for you. You matter. And I don't want to get into doctrinal delicacies here. But he's not praying for that heathen who has no interest in God. He's praying for you who had a long day at work and you're tired. He's praying for you who are worried about health care things. He's praying for you who are wrestling with um, Connie McDowell. I meant to mention, I think it's in the prayer sheet. Did you get prayer sheets tonight? Okay, I didn't get one. I was in here busy with... 300 kids. Um, Connie McDowell's father passed away this morning about 3 o'clock. And, and Jesus is praying for Connie. He says, I, I've prayed for them. I'm not talking to Jesus. I'm not praying for the world. I look, these are my people. It's a pretty amazing thing that our Lord prays for us. And we'll see that more in a minute here about prayer. But um, look a little bit further down there. Look at verse 11. And now I am no more in the world. He said, I'm done with it. I'm not in the world, but these are in the world. And I come unto thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. He's, he says, I'm, I'm leaving the world, but God, these people are stuck in it. You know, he's praying for you that are wrestling with this world. The long hours, the crooked business deals, the, the, the stupid laws, the... The, all the, you know, what are you going to do with vaccination laws that are changing? And what are you going to do with business laws and unemployment laws? And, and what do you do when you're 50 or 60 and looking for a job? And, 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 and nobody's, <laughs> what do you do when you're 70 and you're sick? And the, the hospitals just don't do a lot with 70-year-olds that are sick. And I trust you. You can trust me with this. I've been in the hospitals all the time for the last 33 years. And our seniors are being squoze right out of medical care. What's sad is a lot of those seniors voted for the guy who's doing it. Now we are, the last seven years has hurt our seniors' medical system. 
irreparably. I don't, know if, I don't know if anybody could make it go back except God. And it's and we got to trust him with all this. But but see, he says, he's praying. He says, Father, I'm done with the world, but these people, they need you. They're, they're seeing their kids stray. They're seeing their kids sick. You know, Phyllis Vitans, I don't know how old Phyllis is, 75, 80 years old. Phyllis is going to go to the hospital tomorrow while her daughter's in serious. Nobody should be in the hospital watching their children have surgery. But it's all the time. Just a few couple of weeks ago, um, Brendan Williams, you know, the happiest, great spirit, best spirited little guy in the whole church. And, you know, mom and dad sit there watching him go through all that he went through. And God knows you're hurt. And Jesus, we're talking about prayer. This is, this is a model prayer, a prayer for us to study. Man, he, he prays for you. And he cares for you with your battles in marriage and your battles with money. And, and, and this world is a battle. This, this whole world is a battle. Look a little bit further. Look at verse 12. And I apologize. This, uh, we are still experimenting with this mic. But um, verse 12, uh, it works fine when I look up, but I will look down and things change. Verse 12, I was with them in the world. So you notice the world over and over and over again. I was with them in the world. I kept them in thy name. And he goes on, look at verse 13. And now I come unto thee, and these things I speak in the world. I'm leaving the world, but I'm speaking in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in them. You know what he's saying? Here again, it's, now remember, this is Jesus talking to the Father, praying for you, praying for the disciples, but you'll see in a minute he's praying for you as well. You'll, that'll be very clear in a minute. But he says, Lord, this world's a mess. And Tim, good to see you back. I saw you Sunday, but... Anyway, I don't want to interrupt my sermon, but anyhow. Um, he says, this world's a mess, and, and I'm leaving, but, but Lord, I, I've spoken all these things because I want my people to have joy. Now, what parent doesn't want their kids to have joy? What parent doesn't want their kids to have happiness? So we start talking about prayer. I don't think it's wrong for me to pray that my kids are happily married. I think it's pretty biblical prayer. I don't think it's unbiblical at all for me to pray, you know, on a Wednesday morning we meet with the men and, and for, we'll, we'll pray for our business owners and people who are managers. I don't think it's wrong for me to pray that, man, God, give them a good day. Give them some good sales. Give them some productive contracts open. Why would we, what would be wrong? Jesus said, I put all these now specifically, if we want to get doctrinally, he said, I've put this word in their world so they'd have joy. This is where your joy is. But literally and specifically, Jesus wants you to have some happiness. He does care. And that's what we ought to have prayer lists. I, I take, uh, I take uh, if, you, if you send me a picture, and I don't know why I don't do it with everything, but I, I'm just picture oriented. I'm a child at heart. But if you sent me a picture Christmas card or a picture in a Christmas card, I've got them all stacked up in my study. And I don't go through the whole stack every day, but I'll pick the stack up and I'll just take those pictures and look at you, look at your children, look at your dog. And, uh, you know, go through the stack, pray for the next one, you know, and I'll go through just whatever I feel like that day. And what's neat is seeing, seeing uh, somebody expecting in the Christmas card picture and then and the babies in the nursery tonight and um, praying God bless their marriage, bless their kids, give them joy. I look at a picture and I remember when their marriage was really shaky. And I know they're happy tonight. I think, God, thank you. Give, give your people joy. Help them through the difficult hours. Um, that is biblical prayer. You, you know what we haven't seen yet? Help me. It's not in there. You're looking at the perfect per person praying perfect prayers. And next year I'm going to get 4,000 pictures and Christmas cards. <laughs> yeah, but it's all right. I'll stack them up and pray. Uh, the, but see, the, he's concerned about this world being hard on you. He's, con see, he's called us out of the world. He's not praying for the world. He's praying for you. He's praying that you'd have joy in this world. All the pressures of the world. Look down a little bit further about the world. Look at verse 14. He said, I've given them thy word. And the world hath hated them. He knows that you live in the Christian life costs you. He knows that, that there's some abuse that comes when you stand up for Christ. And, and certainly in our world, it's very little. But understand, we're in a 150-year window of grace, but we're 2,000 years into the church. 
So for about 1,800 years, God's people were beat up miserably. And, and again, we've had this wonderful thing going on here for a while. And so he says there, I've given them your word and the world's hated them. Look at this next phrase, because they're not of the world. They don't belong in this place. And Jesus over and over talking to his father said, my people don't belong in this world. This world hates them and they don't belong here and they love you and they've accepted you and, and they've honored you and they know you sent me and they know I, I'm glorifying you. You know, how can we love this world when you read a prayer like this? He goes on a little bit further about the world. Look at verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And we are not to be of the world, but we are sent into this world. And it's our job. And so we, we see in Jesus' prayer, he wants the world saved. He's praying for you, and then he's sending you into the world. He's praying for us to have joy, and he's giving us his word, and he's concerned about your hurts and the battles that you're facing in this world, but he really, really wants you to go into that world, that ugly, dirty, hateful, spiteful world. He wants you in that world. Quickly, let me show you a couple other things just about this. Look down, uh, um, look at verse 19. I'm going to have to skip a little bit here. And for thy sake, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Now, the word of God is the truth. Um, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So he says, I have set, look at verse 19. The word sanctify means I've set myself apart. I've, I've taken myself and moved myself to a special purpose. I've separated myself from the things of this world that they might be separated. And again, this is kind of wrapping up this whole principle of the world. Jesus said, I, I've set myself apart because I want them to be able to get out of this mess. Nothing at all wrong with you praying for your kids. God, help them. I've tried to have my TV right. Tried to have my, my home clean. We have separated ourselves. God, would you, would you help my kids be separated? Because understand, our kids got to make their own call. And some might make it at 12 or 14, and some might not make it till 20 or 25. You know, it's different for me. I got saved at 18, and, and I made the decision to walk away from the world. But my children, they got saved at 4 and 5. They didn't decide to leave the world. And, and those, man, I want my kids to make that call. But they got to make it. They got to decide to get saved. They've got to get, decide to get close to God. They've got to decide to walk with God. They've got to decide to, to say no to this world. It's a pressured world. And Jesus says, you know what? I have sanctified myself and I'd sure like them to be sanctified too. And again, all through this thing, as I, and of course I've read it a lot, but as I look at this, I just see the heart of a loving Savior. You that long for your children, you that, that grieve over you, you know, you look at your kids making decisions and there's nothing you can do. You, you, now, I'm not saying just pray, but it's, you, you just pray. It's all you can do. God, help them not be worldly. Help them not follow the garbage music and the garbage lifestyle. And you, you, all that anxiety in you, it's right there. We're reading that in our Savior. And so he goes on a little bit further. Look at verse 20. I love this. Neither pray I for these alone. Now, understand he's around the disciples. And he says, neither prayer for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. So he says, here's the disciples and I'm praying for them, but there's going to be some people who will hear the disciples preach and they're going to get saved. Father, I'm praying for them. And I don't know that there's any period that stops that. So as far as I'm concerned, in John 17, Jesus is praying for Bruce Goddard. Because some of those apostles told some other people who told some other people who told some other people who told me and I got saved and that prayer is for me. And I love the fact that the tenderness and the concern and the love of Jesus Christ for his people is for each one of you. You're a young married couple just starting out in life. This is, this is the creator of the universe imploring the heavenly father on your behalf. You, you didn't get any better than that. You just can't find anything better. I want these people. And then uh, one, one more thing we saw earlier. He said, I sent them out into the world. I want them to tell the world. But look at verse 21 and 23 just quickly. We need to stop. 
He said um, that they, they well, let me put verse 20 in there, so it makes, puts it in context. Neither pray are for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, verse 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. And look at this, the summary, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You know why he's praying for you? Because he wants that world saved. He wants the world to believe in him. And then again in verse 23, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Our, the heartbeat of our Savior is for souls. And again, nowhere in here did he pray for deliverance. Nowhere in here did he pray for a peanut butter sandwich and nothing wrong with that. I'd pray for both those things. I guarantee if I was in jail, I'd be praying for deliverance. Uh, I, I am into, uh, I'd, I'd rather be a soul winner than a martyr. That's just me. Uh, that's maybe carnal. Maybe you want to be the martyr. I'd rather Jesus come again and let you be a martyr as we go airmail. But, but our Lord, he loves you. He understands your hurt. He cares about you now. So our example in prayer Pray just like that for each other. Talk to people. Talk to God about people. Talk to God about your day. Talk to God about your burdens. Talk to God about, I mean, just tell him about work and about home, about your dreams, about your goals. I don't know how many hours. I don't know. I don't know, hundreds of hours. I, no idea how many hours I've talked to God about my dreams. And I've told him over and over, I, I, I know I'm approaching 60, but you know what? Moses didn't even start till he was 80. And I happen to know you're not a respecter of persons. And I've got some things I want to see done. And uh, I, I could coast. This church is a great church. And, and we could just kind of put aside all expansion and all big things. Just enjoy some camps and conferences and enjoy getting old together. And I don't want to die. Who wants to be a Dead Sea Christian? I want God to do something. And I, I just talk to God. I just driving down the road. I don't know how many times I've stopped in front of that school on Lemon Street and just parked there and talked to God. And there's one big wall that is a, a big open wall. And if you're going down Lemon, it's just like a giant billboard. I say, God, I'd like to put right up there in Spanish, Jesus saves or uh, the no hope in the Pope or something, something Christian like that. <laughs> Because the Catholic Church is right up the street, and they're all going to come down and see that. You know, come hear the Bible instead of church traditions or what, something pleasant and warm and loving. But, uh, but I've talked to God about what we do. I, I've sat and looked at pictures of our building and our property here and talked to God about these buildings and said, Well, God, if we could do this and that, why not? Don't you think God likes to talk to you? And he's your God. He's your Father. And he loves you. So when we pray, let's think about our example. Your Father bless us tonight, and, and may we be people of prayer. May we not take prayer as some empty, emotionless, intellectless thing where we repeat some vain words. But you're our Father, and you called us friends. You, you love us, and uh, you love this world around us. And as you pray for us, you want us to go into that world. And I pray tonight that you'd help us. Give us joy. Bless our homes, our marriages. Bless our jobs. Give us help as parents trying to raise children. And we do pray, Lord, that we might, uh, that we might be able to make it through the difficult hours. The heat's hard on some people, and, and uh, folks need extra grace. And some of our folks up in years battling health problems and medical insurance problems. And Lord, they just need grace. I think of Betty on and the, all the adjustments in her world. And, and uh, the Vitans is so many of our good people wrestling. Lord, bless your people. Give them joy. Give them peace. Be near to them. And may we be a help to those we meet this week. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you. Have a great night.